everybody, this is Tim Wolf. You probably haven't heard of me, but you will if I have anything to do about it, by the grace of God. I've been an entrepreneur, been in, in business. I worked for some large Fortune 500 companies, and so my, I've got an MBA, engineering degree, and I was able to segue into working music full-time. I had always worked on music part-time as a hobby, weekend band, that sort of thing. In 2017, at the end of 2017, I was lucky enough to be able to move to Nashville to, to pursue my dream. And I looked at a lot of different places to move to. And I looked at LA, I looked at New York. New York's my favorite city in the entire country. I lived in New York for four years, uh, some time back, and uh, Upper East Side loved it and moved back in a heartbeat. But I ended up moving to Nashville. And even though Nashville is known mainly as a country music town, there's a lot of other music coming out of here. Kelly Clarkston lives in Greater Nashville, Hendersonville. Justin Timberlake bought a place down Leaper's Fork, I believe, down which is down by Franklin, which is 30 minutes from Nashville. And a number of other artists, Jack White, of course, has made Nashville his home, moving from Detroit. So those, those artists are definitely not country. So Nashville is getting a reputation slowly not being just a country town in fact we've got a bracelet nashville is not just country music it's actually i've been wearing it since i first got it and it's worn out i mean you can you can't even read it i need a new one i moved here with the intention of being an artist and i'm fortunate enough that i have the income to do that and support myself while i build my career I know that most artists don't have that so I, I am very fortunate and blessed beyond what i deserve for sure what I want to talk about in this vlog is my journey, and this is the first of hopefully a number of them. Got my trusty cup of coffee. I always drink coffee all day long, it seems, and I'm sitting it on my on my saxophone case. Probably not the best thing, but uh, maybe in the future I'll have more accoutrements for setting up for this this event, which I hope to do weekly on my YouTube channel. Why I stopped going to song critiques is basically what I'm talking about, and I moved here, like I said. And I've quickly cycled through what songwriters do when they come here and all the events and all of the availability, available things. And there's a lot of resources available in Nashville. And it is a songwriter town. But there's also something that I call the Nashville box. And it's a term that I coined. And it is a way of doing things here in Nashville. And it's not a one size fits all. Or it is a one size fits all, I would say. And I've, I'm not the first person to say that it's somewhat calcifi calcified. Um, Nashville has done things a certain way for so long that uh, they're still doing those things. And in a lot of ways, uh, it's a very traditional town. Very much country dominates. And... When I go to the songwriting events, one thing that I found is that even though I made it clear from the beginning that I was writing songs that I was going to sing for myself as an artist, uh, still the feedback was directed toward getting cuts. And getting a cut means that you write a song and, and then another artist, signed artist, successful artist, hopefully a superstar, uh, will sign, will sing your song and put it on their album or on streaming, which is more current. And like I submitted a song to a local service and they give great advice. Uh, and I put right in my in the summary of what the song was about that I said, I, I wanna submit this song and give me feedback to make it a better song for me to sing. And the critiquer, professional critiquer, uh, sent back his response or her response, his or her response, and it was, wow, this is a great song. You don't need to change anything. You just need to get a, a great demo singer and do a great, get some great demo artists and do a great demo of it. And I appreciated that advice and that he thought the song was, didn't have any, he didn't have any comments on how to improve the song, but he, he just completely was blind to my needs. Put me in the Nashville box, as I, as I said, as I would say. And not to say that uh, the advice is bad, it's not. I've learned so much since I've come here. And I, and I don't mean to say that all of these experts that are pro writers that have had hit songs don't know what they're talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. What I am trying to convey is that for me personally, in my journey, what I have found, what works for me and what I need to focus on and 
when you go to a songwriting critique, uh, one thing I've noticed is that they will, like, I've been to events where there are probably 70 songwriters in a small room packed shoulder to shoulder, and there are some industry pros there who will listen to a verse chorus of your song. This is a regular events, weekly events at different organizations here in Nashville. And they will listen to your song and they will verse chorus, just the verse chorus, because they have to get through a lot of songs. That must be an exhausting job. I would not want to do that job. And then they give you commentary on the song. And they usually, it's a stack of CDs. They still do it by, with CDs. And you bring your CD, uh, which is an archaic media form, I know. Uh, and they don't even make CD players and cards anymore, I don't think. But you bring your CD and they put them in a stack and they review them in the order at which they receive them. So if you come early, there's usually a line out the door, this particular organization. And um, first come gets to go first. And it'll go till like eight o'clock at night. So it's a long night for the critiquers and uh, I wouldn't want that job. And they, they do their best. But one thing I noticed is that they always ask, Who, whose song is this? They get grab the CD. And before it's queued up, they say, whose song is this? And they ask whoever it is in the room to, to raise their hand or come to the front or whichever it would be. Now, I think that serves two purposes. One, it makes sure that person is still there because if the person had submitted a, a CD, a song, and wasn't there, they're not going to give the critique because it's meaningless because the person isn't going to hear it. So if the person, if there's no one that jumps up and says, hey, that's my song, after they say the name of the song and the name of the artist, or the name of the songwriter, then they will go on to the next one. So that's very viable. I mean, that's very, they should do that, I agree. But the second one is that they, this is my own personal and also other songwriters have, have uh, verified this. They suddenly are making some judgments before they even press, press play. And one example of a, of a songwriter at an event, uh, a gentleman close to my age, and he said that he, he does some co-writing with a younger uh, a, a kid, like in his early 20s. And he's noticed that if they submit the same song uh, to different events, I guess he must submit the same song over and over. He noticed a pattern that it's the same demo, the same song written by the same two people, exact same music coming out of the speakers. If he will submit it and they say whose whose song is this and he'll identify himself more than not this song they'll say it's dated it's a dated song you, you need to update your songwriting but if his young co-writer will submit the same song he he said observation his observation was that they don't his young co-writer doesn't get the it's a dated comment so it, i mean it's human nature right we we all do it I mean, no matter what it is, I mean, we, we make judgments. Uh, it's just who we are. I mean, I, it's just a, rightly or wrongly, we, we do that. And I don't, I don't begrudge the, the critiquer for doing that. I mean, they have a small window to, to make a decision so they can hopefully give you good positive comments. And that's a tough job, as I keep saying. I mean, it's a, it's a hard job and they, they do their best and they do good work. But I'm just saying why it doesn't work for me and why I stopped doing that. So he said, this uh, fellow songwriter, who I happen to meet in passing, I don't even remember his name, but he said what he does is that he just shrugs his shoulder and he says, what can you do? And he says he tries to get his co-writer to submit the songs more than he does because he gets a favorable response. So again, it's human nature. It's human nature. Uh, and songwriting critique is a subjective thing. I mean, it's not like uh, CPA accounting, do the numbers add up or do they not add up? Uh, although if you do a deep dive into, into accounting, there is some, some judgment things as to how to, how to uh, apply certain things. But, but anyway, it's much more numbers driven and much more objective than say, than songwriting is. Songwriting is, sub music is subjective. So, Again, I do not blame them, but it's not working for me. So 
And another thing that happened to me, oh, and also that same organization, um, I was at a song critique. Now they also do song critiques, not pitch to publishers, and where they have the, the pros up there. And I submitted a song that the title of the song was a question. And the, the young critiquer literally said, don't write songs with questions in them. And I'm like, what? Didn't you? I mean, I mean, I can name so many songs that, great hit songs that have questions in them. There was a, a very recent Justin Bieber song, uh, title escapes me right now, that had a question in it, huge hit. Top five of the Hot 100, I believe. So, and so, so many examples. So why is this young critiquer saying, don't write songs with questions in them? Uh, that's just bad advice. Now this particular person was inexperienced and maybe they shouldn't have had that job that particular day, I, I don't know. But, so that's the kind of mixed bag you get when you go out for critiques and it can crush you because you've, you've uh, built this song up and you've spent all this time to, to develop it and it's like your baby and it's hard. It's hard to get those negative comments. And I, again, I want to emphasize that I'm not saying not to get those critiques. I have learned and my songwriting has grown by leaps and bounds uh, because of some of the critiques that I've had um, through the years. In fact, one of my mentors, a song coach that I went to for some period of time, his, he said, you need to learn to take your beatings. You need to go and get the critiques and take them. And yes, I, I think that's important, but there does become a time if you are going to be an artist, which I am, write songs for myself, that it's a little bit different path. And I can't imagine, I mean, I just recently read Bruce Springsteen's book, his biography, Born to Run, I believe is the name of it. And I also watched the Netflix special of his Broadway show, just absolutely amazing. One of the biggest disappointments in his book, it was a great book, incredibly well-written, enthralling book from front first page to last page. Uh, deep dive into, he revealed a lot of things. But it didn't talk about how he got to be the songwriter that he is. Maybe it was natural for him. I find it hard to believe. I mean, it's just, it's a craft that you have to learn just like anything else. Uh, Kobe Bryant was one of the greatest basketball players and I am a Celtics fan, so uh, not, I mean, you know, the Lakers are the, my, more, my moral enemy, but I respect greatness, and Kobe was one of the greatest. Uh, and, I mean, I don't get into the argument of was he the, was the greatest of all time, but he got there, if you study, his work ethic is unsurpassed. I mean, other people are doing two workouts a day, he's doing four. He's getting up at four in the morning, six in the morning. He worked and worked to get to where he got to, to get to his level. And uh, everyone that is at a highest level, it just they just didn't come there fully formed. I don't believe that. So Bruce Springsteen got to the point where he could write those great songs uh, and he got there in some way, but I just can't see him going to one of these critiques. It just doesn't, I just can't see that, how he did that. I'm just would, curious. So kind of rambling a bit here, but uh, my song coach, the difference between writing for a cut where you take the average country artist and they're, they're doing an album, okay, and there's probably, let's say, 10 to 12 songs on that album. Probably the majority of them are going to be inside cuts. Either the artist write or wrote or co-wrote or his producer wrote or the producer's wife or, or husband uh, Inside cuts by people that he'd worked with before, co-written, and sometimes there's room for outside cuts. But they're usually not the majority. They'll maybe be two to three of a 10 song album, what have you. And those particular songs have to offer something that is not being given by the inside cuts. So they're looking for something very specific and that the artist would cut, can't make references to, to things like if it's a song about my kids going to college, whatever, and you're talking about an artist who's like Kane Brown, who I don't think is even 30, you know, that ain't gonna fit for him. 
just a random example that came up, if he would be looking for outside cuts. So you have to write for a very specific, and you have to worry about the range that the vocalist can, that the artist can make. You need to know what their lowest note is or highest note, and you have to do it in the right key. I mean, these are all these constraints that are important in order to get a cut, and the competition is tough. There's a lot of people trying to write songs and trying to get cuts. So you don't want to get knocked out. You don't want to get knocked off the list. So you get, you're lucky enough to get submitted to a producer who or the manager of this particular artist and they're looking for songs that maybe they put the feelers out. They're looking for songs for a new album. Uh, you don't want to get knocked out and say, well, we can't take that because it's controversial or what have you. So you want to be right down the center. You want to be right down the sweet spot of, of the strike zone, so to speak. Uh, because you don't want to get knocked out. But on the other hand, if you're an artist, it's a whole completely different ballgame. In fact, I heard it said by someone that if you write a song that no one would cut, but you, as an artist, that might be the best song for you because you're trying to, as an artist, you're trying to develop a persona. You're trying to develop who you are, and the more unique you can be, the, the more noise you can make. I mean, if you, if, you, uh, if you sound just like 20 or 30 or 40 or even two other people that are just like you, if you're replica copies, why would anybody need you or me? So number one, you have to be unique, I feel. And the Nashville box, as I see it, and I'm not an expert, I don't have a hit song, I'm just a guy trying to make my way into the artist, uh, but I, again, this is my journey and this is my observation. This is what I see and what I'm going to focus on going forward. The Nashville box in that regard doesn't work for me because I want to be different. I want to be unique and I want to have my own voice. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a guitar player and my main guitar player influences Eric Clapton and Santana are a couple and if you hear a song, if I hear a song that they're playing on, and I I don't know the song, but I hear one or two notes of them playing, I know immediately that oh that's Clapton or that's Santana. They have a very distinctive sound, and I think that's very desirable. I think that's very. You want to be unique. You want to have an identity. So, going toward that is is important as an artist, and. As an example, my song coach, who again, I learned so much from and taught me so many particular rules of masculine and feminine rhymes. I mean, many, many other things. That's just two that comes to mind, or one that comes to mind. So I brought to him uh, the, the recent revivalist song, Wish I Knew When I Was Young. And that song is one of my recent favorite songs. I love that song. I, want, I would hope to write in that vibe, and that would be similar to that if I could. And I saw those guys at Bonnaroo uh, Outdoor Festival here in Tennessee last year, and they were at one of the main stages, and they were singing that song. And I saw the entire crowd, I don't know, 60, 80,000 people, whatever it was, packed. It was packed shoulder to shoulder. And every single person was singing that song, not just the choruses, but the verses. And singing it so loud, it was hard for me to hear the lead singer. It just gave me chills in the back of my hair. The, the, next, <laughs> the hair in the back of my neck just, just stood up. And that electricity, that connection with the fan. But when I took that song to my song coach, uh, who's been a, a professor at a local university for a number of years, he, um, he said, oh, that's, that's a poorly written song. Uh, let me take that down, that name of that song, so I can show it to my class as, as an example of what not to do. What not to do. Meanwhile, the, 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 the complaint that he had about the song, those 60, 80,000 fans didn't give a rip about that particular technical point. So that's one area where the Nashville box, if you will, will give you a disservice. And this is my experience again. Just for me, maybe there'll be some people that watch this, hear this, and it'll be helpful to you. This has been my journey and what I see for myself going forward. Again, my song coach has been so helpful and uh, I learned so much from him. And I thank him for that. It's made my songwriting better. 
another another thing about being a, a, an artist songwriter is you go to these events and they have a limited amount of time to to assess your song and I went to an event a songwriting event out of Colorado and uh, went to one of these critique sessions and there was a producer from California there and he was doing critiques uh, and uh, as soon as I saw him I knew that we weren't he wasn't gonna like my song I just knew it because he had that certain vibe about him it's probably early 30s he was wearing that you know flat brimmed hat baseball hat that just just cocked to the side just a little little bit flat the brim completely flat and he had that air about him uh, LA producer and my music is more I guess Americana alternate alternative definitely not in the hip-hop or uh, pop world uh, and maybe not quite as doesn't have the sheen I just knew that he wasn't going to like my songs and there was only four minutes allocated to for each each attendee now I know you're trying to get through a lot of people and there's only you, the organizers doing the best they can and four minutes of critique is better than none right but my takeaway I'm not doing that event again because there are publishers there who are looking for for songs uh, that they could pitch to artists etc and there were some other artists there yes writing their own songs but I, I felt that it was more aimed at at a again writing songs for cuts sort of endeavor anyway so I played my and they have four minutes and in those four minutes they don't get to know anything about your objectives and what your voice is as an artist and what your what you see yourself as what your what your goals are no, there's not enough time for that you have four minutes and most people played a verse chorus of two songs gave maybe a introduction I'm an artist from Massachusetts or whatever it would be and I did that and I played him a couple of my songs and he I mean the way he tore into me he personally attacked me and I mean not physically <laughs> thank God he was behind the table would have been hard for him to do that uh, but he he critiqued in such a harsh way I don't, I don't maybe he had a bad day maybe maybe he just got a bad call from his wife or girlfriend I, I'm not sure but he was uh, angry and it seemed at hearing my song two songs that I played and he implied that I didn't even know the very basic information about song structure you need to learn song structure is what he remember he told me I was devastated and again the song coach said you need to learn to take your beatings I'm not very good at taking my beatings so I need to get better at that but my conclusion after that I mean God bless this guy you know he's coming out there and again I wouldn't want that job you got four minutes to try to assess two songs and give some credible feedback I mean that's hard job but on the other hand for a guy like me who's who's a, an aspiring artist uh, it's just not adding too much it's not giving me fuel for getting to where I want to go I mean so after that event I decided that well, I would for the most part only get direct crit critiques from people on my team who knew what my vision was who understood what I was trying to say and where I was trying to go and so that's what I've I've purposed and that's when I finally decided that I was going to stop going for the critiques again I still have a lot to learn. If I learned all there is about songwriting craft, are you kidding me? I have a lot to learn. I want to learn it all. Uh, and how do I do that? And how do I need to get my songs. My songs can be better. They're not the best they could be. There's no doubt about that. I'm not saying that. However, I found some of these spinning your wheels sort of things that I just talked about. So it's going to be a balance going forward. I'm going to still continue to be open to hearing constructive criticism. No doubt about that. Because again, I haven't arrived. I mean, I'm not at the top of the Hot 100. Absolutely not. I don't have any songs that ever charted. So I'm, I don't, where do I have the balls to come off and say what I'm saying? What I'm talking about is my journey and what I see working for me and how I want my trajectory of my career to go.
One story that that uh, I still still repeat to myself and and to remind myself along these lines, uh, hit songwriter Chris Wallen spoke at an event that I was at last year, and he he's written some great songs. He's married to uh, a woman from my my small school in South Dakota, and but he's uh, I just know him in passing. We're friends on Facebook. I don't even know if he'd recognize me if he saw me in the street. But anyhow, we, we, I was at that event and he was talking about song critiques. And he's written some huge country hits. Breathe and Don't Blank, I think are a couple of the biggest ones. Uh, Just Breathe, sorry if I'm butchering that. But some huge number ones. And he was reading the critiques that had come out on, I think it was uh, Don't Blink, which was, again, a humongous hit for him. And the song had just come out and it hadn't, of course, climbed the charts yet. And there were professional critiquers that were, were giving their opinion of this song that had just been recorded by an A-list country artist. And some of the critiques were pretty nasty. This is a, this is a hit songwriter, number ones. In fact, he, he had uh, an occasion where he had a number one on the charts and it was replaced by another one of the songs that he had written uh, the next week. So it got bumped from one and got replaced by another song that he'd written. I mean, so this, this is some pretty legendary uh, writing uh, skills and, and accomplishments. So this is not some small potatoes guy. And meanwhile, but he's getting hammered on, on this critique. And one of the critiques that I remember very specifically, because we all laughed when he read it, and he, he's a funny guy. He's, uh, he does a great job of delivering things in a way that makes you, entertains you, and, and I think that comes through in his songwriting also. Anyway, he uh, was reading this one critique, but, and the critiquer said, this song is very clunkily written. And we all laughed so hard because the phrase clunkily written is itself clunkily written. So, and in retrospect, the song, based on his performance, was obviously not clunkily written. So, critiquers, you know, they don't always know. You know, a lot, there's a lot of a lot of famous uh, people who passed on. On, uh, I think the Beatles were told that guitar bands are dead. You know, by when they were trying to get a record deal. Anyway, one more thing that Chris Wallen said, uh, and he's, he's got all these great Southern aphorisms that he, he can throw out and make you laugh because they're funny. And he said, uh, getting critiques on your songs is kind of like kissing your sister. Getting critiques on your songs is kind of like kissing your sister. It might be okay if you do it a little, but if you do it too much, there could be problems. So we all laughed uproariously because that's funny, but it also drives a point home. If you want to be an artist and you want to uh, get your songs better, as I do, I mean, I want to get, I want to make, I want to write the best songs I can. Yes, critiques are important. Learning, this, learning the craft, learning the skills, getting feedback on your songs, all of that, it's needed. But if you get obsessed with it, and, and think that you've got to pass all these critiques and get everyone, all these critiquers to like your songs. I think that's the wrong approach. And don't do it too much. Do it enough to learn, but don't do it too much. So one last thing that I want to bring out, and this has given, a lot of these things have been fuel for my fire to go forward and to, to keep pushing, to keep going after, to go after my dreams. There was a Grammy-nominated producer here in Nashville who, who I paid to listen to my songs and give me critiques. And uh, my song, which is going to be my first single, Earthquake in a Bottle, uh, there's some bluesy guitar on it that I played. And he sat down to listen to the song, and we're looking at the screen, and the intro's playing, and there's I got some leads in the intro, and this particular producer goes like this. He goes, I learned those licks in grade school. I'm like, what? Uh, my current producer just can't believe that he actually said that. And I don't know what his goal was to say that. 
uh, if I, of all my skills related to music, if I have any, uh, my guitar playing is probably my most advanced skill. It's the thing I've been doing the longest in, in my in my career. So that was that was a that was a setback. Uh, but the, so I've adopted the the, the phrase "Grade School X," and I'm considering naming my first album. All the, everything I learned in grade school or grade school level licks, something variation on that. I've I made that in, uh, Fuel for My Fire, so to speak. And that's another song that I'm working on, Fuel for My Fire. So, there you have it. I've tried to explain why I've given up going to song critiques from me, what, what I, uh, what I, uh, need to do, I feel, to push myself forward to meet my maximum. Again, don't take away that Tim Wolf thinks he's arrived, because I have not arrived. But I'm far from it. I'm just at the very, very bottom of the mountain as far as trying to reach the goals that I have. But I'm trying to make the decisions and take the steps that are best for me and that keep me motivated that keep me on the journey that I want to go on and can maximize my trajectory to maximize where I end up. Thank you so much for watching my video. Please remember to like the video and subscribe to my channel. Uh, Till next time.